Mike Mayock joins us, of course, former general manager of the Las Vegas Raiders. And before that, he was the lead analyst for the NFL Network's coverage of the NFL draft for years. And, you know, we do this every year, Mike, where we ask general managers the week of the draft questions, even have press conferences. Like, when when you're doing these these interviews, I mean, how far from the truth are your answers? <laughs> I think everybody's a little different. And I think, you know, there are, there are guys that actively mislead and you kind of know who most of those guys, at least, you know, I had a pretty good feel for it. Um, what I tried to do was give as much information as I could give it, give without disclosing anything about a particular player. Um, just because having been in the media, you know, we, I recognize we all have a job to do. Um, but, as I, I was talking to a couple of the NFL Network guys uh, this week, kind of off the record stuff, and I was going, "Whatever you do, don't listen to anybody this week. Just form your own opinions, stick to them, trust your gut. You watch the film, you did the work, and don't worry about what everybody's spewing this week." Mike Mayock joining us here, Doug Gottlieb Show, Fox Sports Radio. Um, you'd you'd been in the media side for years, you know, calling games for NBC doing the NFL Network, calling games for the NFL Network, of course, and then, and then breaking down every different draft pick. You had an, an incredible database of not only knowledge, but analysis, which would seem perfect for you to go work with John Gruden, and you, you were their general manager. Um, what was different from what you expected from a guy who covered the league and knew the league cold to when you're actually in that chair? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Doug. Um, the first thing that hit me when I took the job was, you know, the 20 years prior at NFL Network or 18, whatever it was, I was kind of a lone wolf and in charge of my own production. Um, I didn't have to manage a group of people. And, and trust, I enjoy managing people. I enjoy leadership. But I didn't have to do it for a long time. And it kind of hits you in the face like, wait, wait a minute. You're in charge of a bunch of people who have wives and kids. And, and you know, in, in addition to trying to get to be a better football team, you got to take care of these people also. And that hit me right in the face really quickly. And I think the second thing that hit me was I literally had to fight to find time to watch tape. And ironically, I might have watched more college tape when I was at the NFL Network than, I, than when I was a GM because you spend so much of your time doing other things, especially with all the COVID stuff we had going on for the last two years. I mean, to me, that was mind boggling. I, I hated all the COVID stuff and it, it kind of takes you Doug away from what you love, which is the purity of the sport itself. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure in, in talking to the people I know in the league, they all said like, look, his heart. Some of those guys sat out. So you're, you're wondering, not just, you know, what, what are they going to be like when they come back as opposed to what I'm watching on tape and some of what you're watching on tape isn't against nearly the elite talent because there were guys that weren't playing because they were sitting out. And so it, it, was, it was kind of a hard visual adjustment, wasn't it? Doug, it was bizarre. And, you know, under the general, I guess, title of roster management, they expanded practice squads from 12 to 16 so that you had a pool of available players with COVID. But, I mean, in 2020, we had to play the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers and a bunch of our offensive linemen tested positive after, after the game the week before we played Tampa on a Sunday. They, they came into the building Monday morning and tested positive, literally our entire offensive line, because they hung out together. So we didn't see an offensive lineman that entire week of practice until the following Sunday morning And we're playing Tampa at 1, and they were allowed in the building at 8 a.m. game day, and we had a walkthrough. It was bizarre. We're we're, we're walking through at our facility at 8 in the morning, putting the game plan in to play Tampa Bay at 1 in the afternoon. And that was by no means atypical for any team. It was just a whole different kind of season where you had to throw a lot of crap out the window, and you just had to go find players, get guys up to speed, trust some coaches that knew players from past places to say, hey, let's get this guy in here, and he can pick the system up real quickly. So it was different, but all 32 teams had to deal with it. If you could change one thing, what would it be? (laughs) I'd 
probably have a few, but I think that the hardest thing for me was uh, when we traded for Antonio Brown going into my first season. And on paper, it looked good. Um, you know, we gave up a three and a five, and we're getting an all throw wide out. And, you know, first, and that was the year we were going to be on hard knocks. And the last thing I wanted was to be on hard knocks my first year as a GM, especially, you know, Antonio would came back and he wouldn't wear the helmet. He had a big helmet issue. Then he had, he burned his feet in a, in a cryogenic chamber or something and yes. couldn't practice. And then he left camp. And, you know, meanwhile, we're drafting a bunch of young guys and we're trying to change a culture. And, you know, there's a time and a place, I guess, for that kind of player. But for us and for me personally, that was a tough one. And so uh, that, that's probably what comes to mind most, Doug. Would you do it again? I mean, you had kind of like, and for, for people to understand, when you worked as long as you worked and at the level you worked at the NFL Network, it wasn't a lifetime appointment, but it felt that way, right? That NFL Network's not going anywhere. You weren't going anywhere. You were their guy. It, that, that thing's only growing, right? Yeah. If, if, if you were back in that same situation, would you do it again? Yeah, I would. And, and the reason I would, Doug, is probably twofold. No, number one, I've never been a look-back guy. You know, you come to a fork in the road, you make the best decision you can make, and you go. And, and if, you, if it doesn't go the way you had hoped, who cares? You come to the next fork and you go again. Um, that's number one. And, and number two is that as much as I loved being in the media, and I did, every single day was fun because I was, it was really, to me, it was about the football. It was about the people in the league, the college coaches, the NFL coaches, the, the scouts, the GMs. It put me close to the people every day, and I love that. But, Doug, you know, as a former player, there is nothing like game day. Nope. And I could do a game on a Thursday night, an NFL game, and it could be a big game. Or, and But after the game was over, I could go have a beer and hang out, and it's, it's fine. It felt like I did a good job. I worked hard. But when you're the GM or any part of a team, you live and die a thousand deaths every Sunday, and you can't replace that feeling unless you're a player or some a coach or somebody in that building and you know as a former player it was the first time in, in literally 40 years Doug where I got that same feeling again and so I would never trade that for anything all right help us out they weren't really going to play for the tie they were always going to kick a kick a field goal weren't they what are you talking about the Chargers game yeah I think we're always going to get, yeah, I mean, I, trust me. I've known Basaccia for 40 years, and, and he, he's going for the win every time. I, I, I don't understand how that, it, it felt like Collinsworth was the one that kind of started that whole they might be playing for the tie thing. Like, they're not playing for the tie, you know? I, I, that one, that was, I can't imagine the heart palpitations watching that football game. I, it, I just, it, I, from, from your, I, I can't imagine that one. Especially when you're up 29-14 with about eight minutes left. And, you, you, you're and how about all the fourth field. down conversions with Justin Herbert? I mean, the guys, Justin you Herbert know. went off. He went off, and we couldn't stop him. And uh, I, you're right. I died a thousand times in the last eight minutes of that game in, in overtime. And, but that's what I'm talking about, Doug. Right, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the drug. Right there, that's the drug that everybody, those games, and then win, even losing those games, but winning those games, that's the drug that would make you, what you did, change your life, give away a lifetime appointment for one shot at those things. 100%, and, and don't look back, and I'd do it again. Uh, Mike Mayock, our guest on, on the Doug Gottlieb Show here on Fox Sports Radio. Okay, so help us with the evals this year. You get, you get the, the noise out, well, there's no buzz. You don't have the elite level talent. Um, one of the, the diamonds in the rough, you went and found an unbelievable pass rusher, right? You get there and everybody's, well, Raiders don't have, and you go find one in the third round. Um, Hutchinson's probably the number one overall pick. How did, what is, what is he like on an NFL field? Uh, I, I think a lot of people, a lot, I've heard people compare him to the guy we took, uh, Max Crosby in that first draft. Um, that's become one of the premier guys in this draft, uh, excuse me, in this in the league at rushing the quarterback. Um, I, I think Hutchinson's a, I think he's the surest high level player in the draft. And that, therein lies the rub for, for Jacksonville because obviously people have been talking about it all week. What about Travon Walker? What about the other edge guys? 
Um, is there a higher ceiling? And uh, I, I think this kid Hutchinson's a hell of a player. Uh, he can rush the quarterback. He's tough. He, he's he's smart and he, he off the field. He's not an issue. Um, so yeah, I think you're getting a high level player. And are there other higher ceilings available? Yeah, but there there comes some concern with some of those other players. Okay, so like again, that's a great balance because Jacksonville is in. Not the same position you were in, but they're still trying to establish their culture. Do you yep. swing for the fences there, or do you take the solid double? He feels like, at worst, a double. I, I think you hit it. when you, you see every new head coach and or GM, when they walk in the door, the first word out of their mouth is culture. Right. You've got to change the culture, right? Um, and it's easier to say and really hard to do, and you got to commit to it. And I'm, I'm telling you, really got to get the right, right. We made some mistakes early, but by the end of three years, our culture in our building was phenomenal. And, and Basaccia had that thing rolling as far as guys buying into what he was talking about at a high level. And I'm with you with Jacksonville. I mean, if I'm sitting in there and I'm looking at I'm taking the high-level player that I know that for the next eight or ten years, He's going to set the pace every day in practice. He's going to be a really good player, and let's go. No doubt. Let's set a tone in practice. Let's set a tone, and let's freaking go. Uh, Malik Willis has uh, looks like a ton of talent and upside, but not as maybe refined as a guy like Kenny Pickett. On the other hand, people have question whether it's hand size, arm strength, you know, again, that upward mobility of, of Pickett. If you need a quarterback in this draft, what do you do? It would depend on my situation. And if I had the luxury of getting Malik Willis and giving him to, the time to develop, where it didn't matter if he started week one, week eight, week 11, or year two, week one. If, it, you know, if, if, I, if I had that kind of uh, space on my team and we could do that, I'd love to develop that kid. And I don't know him. Um, I've watched a lot of his tape, but it seems uh, if he's got the intangibles, it looks like he has. I think what people miss is, you know, he's a transfer and he comes in and to Liberty and he came so far in two years. It's kind of mind boggling. Okay. And he's still raw. And I just can't help but wonder two years from now, where is he going to be? And if he's willing to work at it, he's smart and tough. I think the sky's the limit for this kid. He's got an elite arm. He's got an incredibly powerful lower body. Um, he's athletic. I, I love the kids upside. It's Doug Gottlieb show here on Fox Sports Radio. Mike Mayock joining us. Of course, uh, uh, former general manager of the Las Vegas Raiders. And before that, longtime NFL analyst for the NFL Network. And used to, uh, used to prepare us for the NFL draft. And now gives us unbelievable, unbelievable insight. Um if you're the Green Bay Packers, okay, and I, I this is what I find interesting. You have fans go like, well, you got to draft a first-round draft pick wide receiver. And then you look throughout the league, and you notice that even the three uh, wide receivers that want contract extensions, right, the Debo Samuels of the world, the A.J. Browns of the world, the uh, who am I forgetting? Oh, the um, Terry McLaurins of the world. None of them were first-round draft picks. Right? So this is a wide receiver deep draft. They need wide receivers. You're the Green Bay Packers. You're advising them in their green room, uh, in their draft room, boardroom. What do you do? Well, I, I think the whole thing there is patience. You know, when you're not in the top ten and you're down where they are and you've got two picks later in the round, um, I, I think what you're trying to do is put together a strategy that's based on uh, we've got these two first-round picks and there might be one player in this whole draft that if he slid to a certain point, they'd be willing to go get. Like, if so-and-so gets to 12, let's go get them. And I get that. Love that. Um, but they still have Aaron Rodgers, and he makes everybody better, right? So if they're going to sit there at their two spots in the 20s, uh, it's really intriguing to me because the wideout position, as you alluded to, is so deep that, like, for his, historically, Doug, the last five years, the average of wide receivers taken in the first three rounds is between 12 and 13. Okay, that's the average the last five years. Um, 
this year you could make a case for at least 18 to 20 wideouts with grades in the first three rounds, which tells you that we're probably going to have some, some high-level wideouts slide in the fourth and maybe even the fifth. I mean, we took Hunter Renfro in the fifth round, and three years later he had 103 catches for 1,100 yards last year. There are wide receivers everywhere, especially in this draft. So if, if you get to 22 and, you know, you're in love with Jamison Williams and it doesn't bother you about the ACL, by all means, pull the plug if he's there and go get him. Uh, but I think you have to put it in contact with other positions, other needs, and who the best football players are. You can't just sit there today and say we have to get one at 22. Yeah, the context matters. And so oftentimes, I think we do a disservice in the media. And I know fans, they can't understand the context which you just provided for us. And it, the old answer is, it depends, right? It, it, yeah. it, it, it very much depends. Mike, great stuff. Can't wait to talk with you again in the very near future. We really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me, Doug.